Americans. I know many of you have been a part of uh, the majority of all of this particular study and some in the last study, and, and we're thankful for that. And really thankful that we can just learn and grow. I think so much of this in my heart is birthed out of what I mentioned last uh, Wednesday about our theology affects our behavior. And that is so, so true that what we believe should, should direct how we behave. And so in order for us to learn how to behave as believers, we have to know what we believe. Um, and I think a lot of times we can focus, it's a lot easier to focus on the behavior part. It, it's a lot easier as a parent to teach uh, the child what not to do than it is to teach them why they shouldn't do it. And so um, we're, we're focused on helping you understand why, why we should. And so we've come to the end of this uh, very, very important uh, study on uh, Christology and um, the doctrine and the teaching of, of uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to jump right in and uh, walk through this and then uh, we'll be done. And then uh, just by way of sort of like PSA, is uh, we'll take a break. So, so now, now next Wednesday at this time, we are gonna have our prayer night for Easter. You're all welcome to come to that. We've never done one of these since I've been here. And um, it's, uh, you know, uh, never too late to start. So we're gonna start this next Wednesday. So the prayer night is really focused on Easter and just praying for Easter, praying that God would work, um, maybe praying for specific people that maybe you have invited or you're hoping to come or be a part. And um, it'll sort of just be like this. Um, I'll get, we'll gather everybody, I'll say a few words, and then um, we'll break up into just partners. You know, you can pray with your spouse or a friend, and we'll just pray, we'll throw out some prayer requests, and then I'll close it out uh, in prayer. So it won't be a, a super long, uh, night. Kids are welcome to come. Uh, you know, it's going to be a little, you know, a uh, little noisy. That's okay. You know, it's, I think it's good for the kids to see uh, mom and dad or adults on, on, you know, praying to the Lord. And so they get a little rowdy. It's okay. You know, it's, it's prayer. God, God, God can hear through their, through their, uh, through their voices. So uh, that's just going to be a night where we gather together and we just pray for Easter. Really excited for Easter, what God is doing. Um, uh, we have two services. Uh, we're seeing people sort of engage online uh, through the, we've been promoting it and things like this. So we're very thankful for that. And uh, so we're just praying that God will work. So that's next Wednesday. And then you get a break. All right. So uh, the following week, uh, all the way through the month of April, uh, it will be no Wednesday nights. Uh, it'll be a break. So you enjoy that time. And, uh, and then we'll start right back up with our next study the first Wednesday in May. And we'll go all the way through until July, and then we'll take another break, and then we'll start back up. So that's sort of the, the plan. But here we are tonight, lesson number five. The title is Jesus Christ as the Object of Worship. Jesus Christ as the Object of Worship. So we've been talking about different aspects of uh, why Jesus is God and the important connections to that, sustainer, creator, uh, all these things, the Son of God, um, and... Um, and so this is important, and I'll tell you why uh, as we walk through this, but let me give you this to write down. Number one is, this is like the definition of worship, and obviously there's a hundred different probably definitions or variations of, of worship, but from a Christian spiritual perspective, we'll define it as this. Worship is the odd, A-W-E-D, odd response to the saving acts And praiseworthy, it's all one word, praiseworthy. And praiseworthy character of God. I'll say it again. Worship is the odd response to the saving acts and praiseworthy character of God. And if you want a, a, a resource for this, this is from the, uh, the Lexham L-E-X-H-A-M, Lexham Theological Word Book. So if I get, cite my sources. Lexham Theological work, uh, Word Book. And, and uh, so what worship is the odd response to the saving acts and praiseworthy character of, of God. So if you want to write this down too, just as sort of a simple 30,000 foot definition is worship is ascribing worth to something ascribing worth to something. 
A-S, ascribing. Yeah, ascribing or giving, it would be, you know, giving or sort of connecting, ascribing worth to something. So as believers in Jesus Christ, we would worship God. We have a worship service. We sing worship songs. We have a time of worship. And we in our Christian society understand what we're talking about when we say, hey, let's stand together. It's time to worship God, right? Um, we understand what we're doing. We are, we are um, responding to God in awe for his saving acts and his character. Wow, God is love, God is gracious, God is awesome. But worship is something you can do for anything or anyone. It's not specific to Christianity or to spiritual things, right? You can worship money. You can worship, you know, yourself. You can worship uh, success. You can, wor you can worship a sports team. You can ascribe worth to anything, right? So this is why in the Bible you see that worship, uh, like the children of Israel, they would worship God and, and then times they would worship idols. Why? Because worship is an act of ascribing worth, giving worth to something. And um, it's a high level of worth. Like obviously we, we, you know, money is worth something. But if we ascribe it, uh, if we give the value of money a higher value than God, well, then we, in a sense, are worshiping now. So the, the idea of worship is connected to, I, I would say this, this is sort of my thoughts, and I say that so you know not to write this down. No, I'm sorry. But um, my thoughts are, it's, to me, worship is, is, is giving, is ascribing the highest value to something. So I, like, I, I, I love um, the Orioles, right? Uh, baseball. Baseball starts up to, uh, tomorrow. Let's go. Uh, go O's. So I'm excited about that. I love the Orioles, but I don't worship the Orioles, okay? I don't worship the Orioles. I, I don't ascribe that level of worth to it. It's worth it to me to go to a game. It's worth it to me to spend a little money, bring the family down, all that stuff. That's great. But I don't love it to the place of worshiping it. But there are but there are people who in their life have things that they ascribe a high value to and they worship it. And so um, we have to understand that, that, that terminology. Okay, now, let me, I, I'm gonna give you a quote that you're not gonna be able to write down, um, but I just wanna give it to you so we can kind of soak it in. If you want, I'm gonna leave my book up here uh, after the service. Uh, Angela, I mentioned uh, getting some notes and if you want to copy it down, you're welcome to, you don't have to, but let me give you this. This is Jonathan Edwards, who is a Puritan theologian, Puritan preacher. Some of you may know the, the, the message, sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, some of you may have heard of historically the Great Awakening. So the Great Awakening was begun by, uh, historically by a message preached by Jonathan Edwards, a Puritan preacher, who uh, oddly enough, literally wrote out his entire message. He manuscripted out and he would stand behind the pulpit and, and look down and read the entire thing, right? And even in that, God moved greatly and mightily to bring about revival. Um, uh, and as long as God's word is being preached, it doesn't matter if they're shouting or if they're standing, if there's monotone, the word of God has the power to affect lives. And so he was a powerful uh, preacher back in the seven, uh, yeah, yeah, around that time, mm -hmm. John Edwards. So he says this, if a man does not give his highest respect to the God that made him, there will be something else that he has the possession of it, that has the possession of it. Men will either worship the true God or some idol. So this is, this is understanding that we will worship something. As humans, we are designed to worship. God wants us to worship him, but we can replace God with something else. Our natural desire is to worship uh, something, ascribe a high level of worth uh, to it. Okay, so now let me give you a couple of things that connects us to our teaching about Jesus Christ as the object of worship. Here's what to understand, okay, is number one, and I'd love for you to write this down, we are commanded to worship God alone. We are commanded to worship God alone, okay? And this comes from God, okay? So 
Moses goes up to the mountain. He communes with God. God gives him the Ten Commandments. The very first one of all the commandments is this, Exodus chapter 20 in verse 3. Exodus 20 verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. That's what it says. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. So worship, so God says right off the bat, I'm the only thing, the only one, the only being that should rise to the level of worship. There should be nothing else that should take the place and that you should be in awe of but me. No other gods uh, before me. So here's, let's understand. If something rises to the level that you ascribe, as Jonathan Edwards says, the highest respect to, that is your God. So that is what you worship. The, whatever you worship is what is God in your life. And so if you ascribe the highest level to, then that, then that is worship. And we have to be very careful and open and honest with ourselves that we don't ascribe such a high level to the things that we think are very, very, very important to us. They should never take the place of God. God should be above. He always should be, as they used to say, you know, sort of in, in youth group, first place, right, in your life. God has first place in your life. So you should love and value God more than anything. Now, let's think about that, right? So Jesus says, Jesus says, you know, there's people that come to Jesus and say, we want to follow you. And Jesus says, okay, leave father, leave mother, and follow me. What he's saying is, is that, you, that there, I have to be, if you want to truly follow me and worship me, then I have to be the highest respect in your life. So, so I ought to care for and honor and love God more than anything or anyone in my life. This is ascribing true, true worship. So let me say this. I love God more than I love my wife. If I love my wife more than I love God, then Becky is my God. This is how important this is. And Becky loves God more than she loves me. Now that's, that's like a, like, that's like eating a big horse pill right there, right? Like, huh? But if we take it to that extreme, then this is what God is saying. You, there is no one else that should rise to the level at which you worship and adore and love and ascribe worth to me, right? So what he's saying is in a situation where if, 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 it's, if it's, I have to follow God or I have to follow my spouse, what God is saying, Exodus 23, I follow God. I forsake father, mother, and my own life also, right? He that comes after me, whosoever will save his life will lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. So there is, a, there is a calling of believers to worship and love God. So what's the, what's the first commandment, right? And thou shalt love the Lord your God. Not the first commandment, but the first, the new commandment. A new commandment I give to you, Jesus says. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Do you see the order he places there? So that I, so and here's another connection. The other connection is this, and just this is not like a marriage uh, or a, a family thing, but we'll go there for two seconds. I cannot love my wife the way she should be loved unless I love God the way he needs to be loved. So there's a connection. If I love the Lord with all of my heart, and with all of my soul, and with all, if I ascribe to him the highest worth, then I can love my neighbor as myself. And so there's an order there. And so as we think about that, God is to be worshiped and he is to be praised. He is to be reverenced. He is to be adored. He is to be, um, he is to be lifted up in reverence. And, and, and it's important for us to understand this. Now, some, some churches, denominations, some uh, religious institutions would take this and they would put this in their 
sort of like practice on Sundays where you come in, it's real quiet, you know, you don't say anything and it's very somber, very serious. And so each to his own, right? There's no, because the Bible talks about, I'll mention it this Sunday, about praising the Lord loudly, right? Palm Sunday is this Sunday where Jesus rode in on the donkey and the palm branches. So we're gonna jump out of John for two, two, sir, uh, two Sundays and we're gonna do Matthew, which is Palm Sunday, and then another one for Easter, which talk about the risen king. But it's interesting when you study out Matthew 21, where Jesus comes in to the city of Jerusalem riding a donkey and the Bible says that they, that they shouted loudly, like they were, they were not ashamed at all to declare Hosanna, right? Blessed is he. And the Bible says uh, that, uh, that the, uh, the city of Jerusalem was stirred, stirred. That word stirred, Greek, is, is seo, which is the root word for seismo, which is where we get our word seismograph, which means earthquake. So literally they're saying the city was so stirred, it was like an earthquake, that was happening because of the praise of, of uh, the Lord. But either way, what it should be is reverential and respectful and not, and not self-indulging. So, so when we worship God, we are doing it to take the attention off of us and onto him. So this is how you know, it's, to me, I would say it's wrong worship but I would question worship that draws a lot of attention to me, right? Look at me, let me, and, and doesn't necessarily focus on the Lord, right? This is why at Heritage is very, very important. This is a little insight. See, when you come on Wednesday nights and you stay till the last week, you get insider information, all right? This is behind the scenes at Heritage, right? So I want you to notice this this Sunday. So notice this, if you think of, if you remember it, notice it. When we plan our worship songs and our worship uh, services, we actually have an order in which the songs go. So the first song is always what we call a gathering song. It's, a, it's an upbeat song that focuses on thanksgiving, on general um, thoughts about God, right? Just general thoughts so that the, the, the young Christian or the unbeliever could sort of agree with that, right? Like, We'll sing a song about God is love or God's gracious. And even an unbeliever can say, yeah, like, I, yeah, that's true, right? Okay. So then we go from, and there's, it depends if we have four songs or three songs, whatever. But uh, so we have a Thanksgiving, we have a, a, a gathering song. We gather together. Then we have a Thanksgiving song. Let's thank him for what he has done and who he is. So Lord, you're good. Or I can't remember what we sang this past week, but uh, you know, uh, along the lines of, you know, uh, you know, God, you are great and awesome. How great is our God? And sort of this like, you know, thankful, uh, you know, gratitude uh, song. Then we move into what's called a testimony song. So a testimony song declares what God has done for us, for us, for me. So that's a lot of times songs about salvation um, and, you know, how he saves us. He lifts us up. He heals us. He helps us, right? Um, he encourages us. He's redeemed us. That's the song. And then we always have the last song is what we call the vertical song, the vertical song, or it's a song of what we, it's another uh, phrase for it that we use is the song of pure ascription. So, so the reason why we, we structure the song, the last two songs are a song and then scripture most of the time, 99% of the time, is because we want then for our focus to be on God's word and then God himself. So it's a vertical song. And, if, and the, the thing about the vertical song it has very little, and if we can find them, and they're hard to find, um, but the, when we do find them, we hold on to them, it has very little to none. The goal is none, but very little to none personal pronouns. So the last song has zero personal pronouns. There's nothing in there about me, we, I. It's all you, you, you are. So as a, pers uh, a song, of, a vertical song would be... Um, like, what a beautiful name. You were the word from the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're hitting glory in creation, now revealed uh, to you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name. There's nothing in that song that says me. 
It's all about him. His name is beautiful, powerful. So that's a, that's a vertical song that focuses all on the Lord. And also we sing songs to the Lord, to the Lord, not about the Lord. So uh, the difference would be like an old hymn. Some of you know this old hymn. My Jesus, I love thee. My Je- I, I know thou art mine. I'm singing to the Lord as opposed to um, another, another one, a good one would be how great thou art, right? So we're singing to the Lord. Uh, We're not singing about the Lord. Nothing wrong with those songs. Um, The song that's been popular recently, How Great Is Our God, right? So we're sort of singing about the Lord. I I could how great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God, right? So I could sing that. But so we focus on two areas in the worship service. It's very, 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 very intentional. So I'm heavily, so I'm not involved in a lot. I don't micromanage here, okay, at all. And you can ask the staff. I don't micromanage. We empower them. We let them lead. But there are, there are two areas that I'm highly involved in, okay? Number one is the preaching. <laughs> that's okay, that's number one. Number two is the worship in this room. So though Becky oversees that and she, she knows my heart and knows our culture and knows the vision, it is very much close to me because of we want to worship the Lord and we want to bring reverence. So we're not gonna sing silly songs. We're not going to do silly things. We're not going to have songs that are just, I, even, I, I speak in a lot in this about how we do it, how, how many times do we do it, you know, the, the lighting when we do it. And Becky gets it all. She knows it. She's, she doesn't need me to speak in, uh, but she gets it. But I do because it matters. Why? Because worshiping God matters. It matters. It also, let me just say this as a note, because I don't always get to say this. It also matters when you come in, okay? Because we're trying to set the environment so that you have a focus on the Lord and we're going somewhere. We're going from, isn't God great to, it's me and God in the room and I'm thinking all about him and not about me and not about what I need. I'm thinking all about about him. We had a, a family here that visited from Maryland this past Sunday and they're friends of mine that came and visit me, surprised me. And I asked them, I said, how'd you like the service? And they said, it was great. And they said, they said, man, it felt like, it was like, like we were like singing about Jesus. And I'm like, and like in my, in my heart, I'm like, that's exactly what we want, right? That's what we want. That, that's the focus. Anyway, my point in saying all that is that there has to be, there's a lot of intentionality when it comes to God in worshiping. We are commanded to worship God, okay? Alone. Now, here's the key in this. So if God is to be our highest respect in all, and we are to worship him with the highest respect and worth we can, and there should be no other gods or anything that even comes close to that level of ascription and praise and, 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 um, and respect and reverence, then Jesus being the object of worship poses an issue that we have to examine. If we are to worship Jesus as we worship God, then one of two things is true. Either we're gonna replace God with Jesus and worship him, or Jesus is God, so it's okay to worship him, right? I'm gonna take the ladder, all right? I'll take the ladder for 200, all right? So, so, so that's where Jesus as the object of worship is not like, yeah, of course we worship Jesus. Like, of course we do, right? I mean, he's like Jesus. No, no. For us as believers in Christ to worship Jesus, what we are declaring when we worship him is that he is God. That's why we worship him. We worship him because we believe he is God. Now, I'm gonna give you a couple things here that'll help us understand this a little bit more because the Bible shows this. Number one, you can write this down. The worship of Christ is seen at his birth. So we see the, the, wor- the worship of Christ is seen at his birth. The worship of Christ is seen at his birth. So if you're at the water cooler tomorrow and you're like, hey man, you should come to Easter. We're gonna worship Jesus. And someone says, well, why would you worship Jesus? I thought we we're only supposed to worship God, right? You say, no, we worship Jesus because Jesus is God. Because in the Bible, we see in very specific places where Jesus was worshiped as God, okay? Where do we see that? Here's one reference you can write down, Matthew chapter two. 
and verse 11. Matthew chapter 2 and verse 11. So this is where um, the wise men came to Jesus. Side note, not at the manger, all right? So the wise men, your, your nativity scene is unbiblical if you have wise men at the manger. I, what I would do is I'd set the nativity and I'd put like the wise men like, like two feet away, all right? To signify the right biblical. They were, they were, there, they were in close proximity, all right? They were, they were coming, all right? But they weren't there. How do we know that? Matthew chapter two and verse 11, I'll read it to you. It says this, and going into the house, they saw the child with, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Matthew chapter two and verse 11. They worshiped him, okay? Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So the first thing the wise men did, these educated men, these men of scholarly understanding, they come in and they fall down to the feet of a baby who's like eight days old. And the Bible says they worshiped him. So when they worshiped him, it wasn't like they were like in awe of him. Again, understand what we're saying. When we see this word worshiped, they were ascribing the highest respect of worth to him as if it was God himself in the manger or in the bed or in Mary's arms. They worshiped him. So we see this at his birth. Why would these men worship him? They worshiped him because he is God, okay? He is God. Now I want you to also, another reference for, we see the worship of Christ at his birth is Hebrews chapter one and verse number six. Hebrews one, verse number six, okay? It says this, and again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So when God brings and allows Jesus to be in the world, the Bible talks, Hebrews is a great book. I'm telling you, we might be in Hebrews here in three years when we're done with John. But Hebrews is a great book where it talks about how he is better than the angels. So much so that he should be worshiped. God told the angels in heaven to worship him. Why would God do that? Because if God is telling the angels to worship something else, then either God is contradicting himself because he says, I am the Lord, there's no other gods before me. So he says, I want you to worship this, this uh, firstborn, this child, this baby, worship Jesus. And he also says, Exodus 20, don't have any other gods before me. Well, God, what, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to worship Jesus or do you, not, do you want worship you alone? That problem is fixed if Jesus is God. And so the fact that God would say to the angels, worship him, connects the fact that they are not breaking the first commandment in Exodus. They are indeed doing exactly the first commandment. They are having no other gods before uh, the God of heaven and the God of the universe, okay? Let me give you the next one here. The worship of Christ is seen at his resurrection. The worship of Christ is seen at his resurrection. The, uh, the verse for that is Matthew chapter 28, verses eight through nine. Sure, Matthew chapter 28, verse eight through nine. The worship of Christ is seen at his resurrection. Matthew 28, eight, eight and nine. It says this, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. This is the women that were at the tomb, Resurrection Sunday. They saw that he is not here. They said, why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. So they're running. And behold, it says in Matthew 28, 8, 9. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. Can you imagine that seeing Jesus there? Hey, what's up? Right? Tell you, that'd be awesome. That would be amazing. Greetings, he says. And, uh, and the Bible says, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. They worshiped him. These, these women understood who, who said greetings to them. This was not, this was not the, the false prophet who was crucified. This was not um, the, the, the revolting grassroots protester against Rome who failed and was crucified by Rome. I was, I was listening to a 
a uh, recently a uh, very well-known conservative cable uh, news uh, guy. Not cable news. It's like it's more like on the radio on WMEL and stuff like this. And I was listening, and I caught just a, a minute of what he said. And he's he's Jewish, and they said, "Do you believe that Jesus is like the Messiah?" He's like, "No." He's like, "He's just some he's just some some rebel who." you know, tried to overthrow Rome and didn't, and didn't make it, right? I wanted to throw my phone about 200 feet and they're just like, yeah, I hear what you're talking about, you know what I mean? And these are what people think. So understand, like, we celebrate, we celebrate, we celebrate Easter in, in a couple of weeks and we're gonna celebrate the fact that our king is alive, but yet some people still think he's dead in the tomb and somebody stole him, right? And his body decayed out in the grass somewhere, right? If he is risen from the grave, then only God can overcome death and control death and life. And so therefore they worshiped him because he's alive and he is God. Understand the resurrection doesn't happen if Jesus is a man. He's still in the tomb to this day, bones and all, but he is risen from the grave because he is God. And so we see that worship in the... Um, Resurrection, by the way, I didn't, throw, I didn't throw my phone, in case you were wondering. All right, strike that from the, from the recording. I held my phone in my hand and just said, Lord, help this man to understand who Jesus is. Um, and so, so understand that at the resurrection, the resurrection is the greatest proof that Jesus is God. It's the greatest proof that Jesus is God. Because he can make a lot of claims. He can say a lot of things. But he delivered on the third day. And he rose again. It's the greatest proof that Jesus is God. He is not here. He is risen. Come see where he lay. This is why every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection. You know this, right? So, so some people would say, why is church like not on Saturday, right? Because like, you know, that's, the, that's, that's actually like the Sabbath. Because you know, like, you know, the Bible talks about on the seventh day, like Sunday is actually the first day of the week, right? Okay. It's not, the, it's not the last day of the week, okay? It's the first day of the week. And so why do Christians traditionally come to church and gather on Sunday? It's because they, they are not remembering the Sabbath. They are celebrating the resurrection. This is why. This is why we come on Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection, the first day of the week. It also has ties to uh, sort of like tithing and giving our time to God. The first day belongs to to the Lord, that's sort of the idea too. But bigger than that is the resurrection. So if someone ever asks you, well, I thought, you know, Sabbath is like, you know, like the last, like, you know, uh, Saturday. And there's some that observe that. But we as believers in Christ come together on Sunday to celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. That's what it is. That's why we gather. It is a, two weeks from now, Easter, it just happens to be the, the big one of, of the other ones. But every Sunday, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus is alive, proving that he is God and laying, uh, confirming all of the claims and establishing all of the claims that he claimed while he was here on earth. Like, you know, politician, promises made, promises kept, right? We celebrate that on Sunday and we declare it. This is why Sunday is a celebration. It's, it's not a time to come into church and, and sort of be quiet and just like don't bother anybody and shh, right, okay? No, it is truly like a, like a celebration of the resurrection because he's alive, he is God, he's not crazy, he's not insane. He wasn't just some babbling grassroots prophet that gathered a following through his charismatic personality. He is God, he is alive and we celebrate that. So. We see the worship <clears throat> as resurrection, okay? Now, let's, let's continue on here. Let me give you this teaching point. God, God exalts Jesus to a position to be worshiped. God exalts Jesus to a position to be worshiped. God exalts Jesus to a position to be worshiped. And if you haven't turned there yet, go to, go to Philippians chapter two in your Bible. And uh, I'm there right now. But go ahead and take a moment and go there. I want you to see these uh, couple verses. This is uh, what some would call the hymn of Christ or the Christ hymn. Philippians chapter two, beautiful chapter, beautiful chapter on, uh, on who Jesus is. Philippians chapter two. So God exalts Jesus to a position to be worshiped. <clears throat> 
it says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 9, it says, well, let's look, to, let's look at, uh, it's so good. Let's just look at verse 6. So <clears throat> it says, who though he was in the form of God did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. That's the incarnation. The word became flesh. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross. This is powerful. Good Friday. This is Friday coming up. And we think about the death, the humility of Christ, the, the, the brokenness of Christ. And then it says, verse 9, therefore, therefore, because of that, because of the death of the cross and what we know as the resurrection three days later, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. Whoa, don't miss that one. Wait a minute. Let's cross-reference Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. As in my name is the highest name. There is no name higher than mine. There is no one greater than me. And it says, verse 9, uh, and bestowed on him a name that is above every name. So are you saying his name is higher than God's name? No. Because if he is God, then his name is God's name. And that is the highest name. So it says, uh, verse 9, uh, and above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In heaven and on earth and under earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That verse right there is so packed. It's unbelievable. God doesn't share, his, the Bible says God doesn't share his glory with anybody. The Bible talks about that the name of the Lord is, is high and lifted up and exalted. I mean, think about the name of Jehovah, Yahweh, in Hebrew, and the, he, the Jews would, would, would with great reverence and great respect write the name Jehovah. They wouldn't even write it in disrespect or in any type of hes or any type of haste. When they even wrote his name, it was with reverence and respect and awe. This is Yahweh. This is Jehovah. This is the one who dwelt between the cherubims in the holy of holies that no one could see or even experience. There had to be a veil that covered it. God is saying, God is saying, this Jesus is the one exalted above all. He has my glory. His name is above every name. He is God. And we see God positions him in that, in that place. And I love that promise that says one day every knee will bow. There won't be some... You can be atheist or agnostic. You can mock Christianity. You can scoff in your intellect at, at uh, what the beliefs of the Bible are. You can, you can discredit the Bible. But my friend, one day, every knee will bow. Everyone will say, and I, my heart is that they bow now so that they can trust Christ as their Savior and avoid coming judgment. But regardless of that, every knee will bow. There won't be a politician or a king or a pundit or a, or a scholar or somebody who has sort of disregarded God that one day will not confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And so this is where the Bible says, let not your heart be troubled, John 14. You don't have to worry about it. God's got it taken care of. That's one of my phrases I tell my wife all the time. My wife and I, have, you know, we've married almost 20 years. And one of the things I always say to her is, I, I, don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. That's what I say. Don't, don't even worry about it. I say it like a, like a New York mobster. Don't even, don't even worry about it. I got to take care of it. Forget about it. Forget about it. Don't even worry about it. All right? That's why I say it all the time. She'll come. She'll call me. Like she called me, you know, a couple times today and had a couple things going on. And, and I said, don't even worry about it. I got it. Don't, don't even worry about it. She knows I say that, right? Don't even worry about it. I don't want her to worry. I want her to, you know, just enjoy your life. Go, go, go enjoy it. I got it. I'll take care of it. And, um, and that's, I think, that's what Jesus is saying. Like, we're so, we're so like, oh, man, like, what's, like look at this person. Look what's happening over here. Look what's happening. You know, God tells you, don't even worry about it. <laughs> they can say what they want to say. One day, they're going to bow. One day, they'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't even worry about it. 
And, and so I think we have to understand this. We have to understand that one day every knee will bow. We see that God exalts the, his position to be worshiped. Let me give you this um, last one here. I think it's the last one. Yeah, last one here. Uh, is this, <clears throat> is Jesus Christ, it's plural, uh, like possessive, Jesus Christ's divine role as savior makes him, this one's a longer one, Jesus Christ's divine role as savior makes him deserving of our worship. His divine, Jesus Christ's divine role as savior makes him deserving of our worship. So he is deserving. Jesus Christ's divine role as savior makes him deserving of our worship. So now we are to ascribe worth to God, right? But we, we ascribe it to him in, for two reasons. Who he is and what he's done. That goes back, if you look up at your notes, at our definition that worship is the odd response to the saving acts and praiseworthy character of God. So that definition fits how we approach God. Why should I ascribe worth and highest respect to God, and in turn Jesus, because of who he is and what he's done. Who he is and what he's done. This is why I give him my worship. I give him my praise. I offer it to him, and I exalt him. So this is why. This gives us the, the reason why. Because what he has done. Uh, you want to write down this reference? Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 and 13 says this. <clears throat> I, hear some, I hear some Bibles rustling, so I'll wait a minute. Get, let you get there. Revelations 5, 12 through 13. You don't hear that as much anymore now, but back in the day, man, when you're in church, you always hear these people with their Bibles rustling, you know, like this. My pastor, he's funny, growing up uh, back in the day, they had uh, Bible covers. Maybe some of you have a Bible cover, you know, it has a zipper on it, right? And so... <laughs> There was a couple times where he was sort of winding down, you know. You can tell he's winding down. He always got, he sort of does like what I do. Like, well, I do what he does. I kind of get quiet. All preachers do that, you know, at the end. You know, here, now, folks, as we, as we close out this morning. I don't, it's just a thing. And, and, he, and you could tell, like, when he wind down, when he was winding down, all of a sudden, if you, if you listen cl clear enough, you hear the congregation zip, 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 zip. <laughs> And one time he got so annoyed with it, he said, don't zip me yet. He goes, I'm not done. Don't zip me. Right? He used to say that all the time. Don't zip me. Zip, 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 zip. Oh, oh, wind it down. Zip, 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 zip. Zip it up. So, uh, but anyway, that's why I encourage you. I, I do encourage you to bring a Bible. I know some of you use the, the app and stuff, and that's, and that's fine as well. But I, there's something about uh, having a Bible and, and just, just making it your, I don't know. It's, it, there's, no, there's no biblical thing on this, okay? But, but it's just a more of a preference I think there's something about having a Bible, looking at the words. It's very, very important. Um, and, and we try to encourage that. And, uh, but, but you hear those pages. Okay, I digress. Got my rustling. All right, page. So Revelation chapter 5, uh, verse 12 says this. Saying with a loud voice. I love that. I love that verse. With a loud, notice loud voice. Loud voice. Praising loud. In heaven, hey, it's, let me say this right now. It's loud in heaven. Okay, all right? So we're, every Sunday, we're trying to be like heaven. Amen? Come on now, right? Amen? I'm trying to be like heaven. I just want, I'm going to start telling people that when they say, it's a little loud in here. I was trying to be like heaven. Amen? I'm just joking. I digress. All right. Um, so Revelation 5, says the same with a loud voice. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Powerful verses that remind us that Jesus Christ worthy is the lamb who was slain. He is worthy of our worship. He took our pe penalty, paid for our sin. What he has done for us is enough to worship him for all of eternity that he would come and take our place. He is worthy. So if you're trying to figure out where to give your highest worth to and highest respect to, let me point you to the one who took your sins, 
who paid your price, that he, that alone he is worthy. And even if he didn't do that, he and who he is is worthy, that he is gracious and loving and powerful. But praise God, he did that. And that's why the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. Our love and worth to him is for all that he has done for us. And I would encourage you as you think about your relationship with Christ to, to find a quiet two minutes in your life and in your day and just ponder the goodness and grace of God. Allow it to overflow in your life. Allow it to wash over you like a wave in the ocean. Let it, let it knock you back. Let it wake you up to the goodness and grace and mercy and power of God that he alone is worthy. And why would I not ascribe worth? Why would I go after vain idols who cannot give me pleasure, who cannot satisfy me, who cannot? Why would I give worth to anything else in this world? Why would, why would the things of this world matter so much that it would cause it to replace the one who gave me everything? See, this is our theology, right? So this is where our theology will dictate if we truly worship God, if he is the most important thing, then we will seek to love him and please him above all, above all. This is where the, the apostle said we ought to obey God rather than man. And you'll find yourself doing things you would not normally do out of your love and worship for God, for Jesus and what he, is, he has done. And this is where, as believers, as maturing believers, we have to come to this understanding that nothing, nothing, nothing takes the place of God. Nothing. Nothing. There is not anything, not once, not, not for a moment. He is on the throne, as the preachers would say, of our hearts. He is the one that's lifted up. He is the one that we look to and we follow. He is the one that we adore. He is the one in which our lives are governed and decided. It's, and it's not like an optional thing. And, and this is where, honestly, we can get into uh, deeper conversations or, or sort of preferential conversations about this. But, but as a pastor, sometimes we have to understand, like, if, if we truly believe that Jesus Christ is worthy and that he alone provides all that I need, then it's going to it's going to change my priorities. It's, it's going to change what I watch. It's going to change what I say. It's going to change the way that I live and my schedule that I have. It's, it's going to. Like, I cannot look at you and say that Jesus Christ is the one I ascribe the most worth to and respect the most, but yet I got something over here that's going to take me away from that. Right? Well, no, that now, and, and if, we're, if we're theologically walking through this, if something is replacing God for that moment, for that day, for that hour, then that is your God. You, you, have, you, have, you have become, and this is where a lot, if you studied out, Jonathan Edwards is right in his quote that we are either worshiping God or we are living in idolatry. Understand this now. So that if we have something in our lives that replaces God, that is an idol. And ultimately, all roads lead to idolatry. <laughs> that we are worshiping it in a way. Um, and that we need to trust in the Lord. And there's so many practical things. And I know in life, there's a lot of things that happen. But we need to alter and, and sort of course our lives in a way that would reflect what we believe. Right? That would reflect what we believe. And, and it's important that we are doing that. And I try to do that in my own personal life, you know, um, and, and make sure that God is, is first. This is why we pray for every meal in our home. Not, not because it was a tradition that my grandpappy taught me, right? Though it was a tradition that my grandpappy taught me. We didn't call him grandpappy. I'm just saying that for effect, um, right? But it's because when we sit down as a family, and we have food and health around the table and we have, and we're here together, man, we have to give worship to God for that, right? 
So we stop for a moment and we say, God, you are worthy. So we, we, we pray around the, around the table and we, and, and, or I'll pray and I'll say, God, thank you for this food and thank you. And this is why we do this, right? This is why I do it when I'm eating bacon egg bites in my car from Starbucks because God is just worthy and, and, and he is worthy. This is why, this is why, and it's hard for me to say this because I'm a pastor, so I'm here on Sundays, but this is why Sunday is a priority in my family's life. Not because I'm the pastor, but because he is worthy. My son had a, he's in school and he had a, um, this is this going to make the tape, oh Lord. Um, so he had a, he got invited to a birthday party and he goes to a school and, and uh, his friend Claire, Claire, okay. So I said, oh, I said, Miles, Claire invited you to her birthday party, like made sure that he was going to be there. And I said, do you like hang out with Claire? Or do you talk to Claire? Said, Sometimes, you know. Sometimes, you right? know, oh, okay. And so I said, what's the details of the birthday? And so we found out it was on Sunday, right? We're not sure if Claire's a church going a folk yet, but we're working, amen? And so, we'll, we'll, we're, we're, right? And so, and so you could tell, my son, he said, he said, uh, he went, he went, ah. Uh, he, he knew exactly what that meant. There was no discussion. There was no debate. There was no argument. He knew Claire's birthday was at 11.15 to 1.15, and our service is at is at 12. There wasn't even discussion. I mean, we didn't sit there and go, well, maybe we can skip this one time, right? We didn't do that. Now, here's what we did, though, just to give you practical, okay? Here's what we did. Miles came to church. He came, and he left a little early. And for us, that's okay. We're okay with that, right? He, he was a part of his program. He was a part of the church. Matter of fact, he was here longer than anybody because he comes at 7.30 in the morning. So, um, but he was here as part, and that was, and Becky and I talked about that later, and we said, look, it's, it's not that he can't go to Claire's birthday party. It's just that Claire's birthday party is never going to take the place of God. And so we, we, and I'm trying to teach my son, what I don't want, just in case you're wondering, I don't want my son to be like, man, I hate life because all my dad ever did was like shove me in church and I had to be there for 14 hours and I could, I miss birthday parties and I couldn't do anything and I hate my life now and I'm going to rebel and I'm going to go and sow my wild oats. I don't want that either. So what we try to do is we try to plant the seed in his heart that number one is church. But you know what? Hey, we can step out of, uh, just a minute or two early. It's okay. And we can get to the birthday party, right? So this is, this is important for us as believers to practically understand and follow this. If God is to be worshiped and Jesus is to be worshiped, then it will affect the way we live. And it's important that we understand that. And so with that, I open up to any questions, thoughts, comments about this or anything else about the deity of Christ as we close out. Speak now or forever hold your peace because I'm not sure when we'll get back here So uh, to this particular topic. So yes, yes, in the back. Yes, ma'am. That's my fault. Yeah, so forgive us if you've been looking for that. We, it takes a minute to get them up because they are large files. So we'll get them up there. Don't worry. We'll make sure they get up uh, by tomorrow is our goal. Thank you for that. Uh, we missed a couple of, uh, uh, they're not on YouTube. We didn't get the couple of files on YouTube. We've been, uh, we've been like full Easter mode getting things ready. Got all kinds of, all kinds of stuff. We got new lights up here, all kinds of fun stuff. It's going to be great. Any questions, comments, other things? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 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 Yeah, our so just to reiterate what you said, gay, is our society is 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 pushing out God and and let me say this, Christians have operated in in much larger pagan societies than this one right? But I think, I think for us, because we are one nation under God and we were founded on that, to see us removed from that, it can be shocking, I think, of just so many things that we can think about where, and this is where, and I've, I think I've mentioned this in this study or maybe the last one before, that, yeah, I did, I mentioned this study about, you know, the goal of, of Christians is not to make institutions Christian again, but it's to make more Christians in that institution, 
and to be a light and shine the light uh, of the gospel. Because if we are living out what we believe, it will draw the attention of unbelievers. We see this in Matthew 21. They come into the city, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. They are not ashamed at all to praise the Lord. And the Bible says the city of Jerusalem responded with this question, who is this? Who is this? And so as we live out our faith and our theological understandings, it will draw those that would say, tell me, tell me why you live that way. Tell, tell me why this it's important. And, and, and even on that note too, it's just, you know, so many tragic things happen even this week. Tragedy, uh, again, in Nashville with a, with a shooting. And, you know, I thought about that. I dropped my kids off this morning to school. And as I did, I, I'm just being vulnerable. See, you get really behind the scenes here. I just cried. I just cried as I dropped them off and just thought about that pastor who, who if you follow the news, was a pastor who lost his daughter in a tragic school shooting. And I just thought about my kids and I just prayed, God, protect them, keep them safe and watch over them. And I wrote an email to the school asking them for their emergency policies. <laughs> I did all of that. And I said, just wanna make sure we're aware of what's going on here. I wanna make sure, right? And, um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, this is where this, it's in times like these, like in these sort of like, I don't understand times where your theology will keep you strong. I don't know why, but I know what. I don't know why. I, can't, I cannot in any good logic explain why that happened or why God, if we believe he is sovereign, would allow that to happen, that he wouldn't stop that evil. Um, I'm thankful for the brave men and women who rushed in, thankful for our law enforcement officers who eliminated the threat, but but I don't understand. But if I have a strong theological foundation, then I won't be shaken by that. I'll know that in some way, God will work all things for good, that he is in control, he is sovereign, and he will be glorified through this. This is what I know, though I may not be able to see it now. And so it's important that we understand that. And that's why, just by the way, just a, just a side note, I may mention this on Sunday, so I'm trying to practice it uh, now, is this is why we this is why we hire a, 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 law, a law officer every Sunday. That's, you know, we, we contract that out. That costs money. Every, we're happy to pay that. Um, this is why we do that. We take this very seriously. Matter of fact, even through this, we, we've had conversations about even taking additional steps to make sure that this is a safe place. One of the, one of the things that um, was mentioned, I heard a police officer in a press conference of this tragedy, he said this, and I saved it, and I'm gonna bring it up to our leaders on, on Saturday uh, with leadership meeting. And the, the, the officer said this, he said, there was another, there was another target, but the, the suspect said that that target was too secure. And I told my wife, I said, I wanna be that target. That I, want, I, want, I want that, I wanna be that target. I wanna be the target that's too secure. And so this is why we do this, and, and obviously we trust the Lord, but we, have, we are prudent as well and try to live with wisdom. So I just wanna share that, that's my heart, is that I want this to be one of the safest places for you to come and drop your children off and worship and, and feel safe and, and um, you know, it's like insurance. We hope we, we never have to use it, but we're glad we have it if we do, amen? So any other questions, sorry, a little off, er, back on the path here. Uh, I have two minutes still, because we didn't start till 8.05, or 7.05, so I got two minutes here. Any other questions, comments? Yes. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, praise the Lord. God's good. Amen. Amen. No, I enjoy it, actually. I really do. It's a different speed for me, um, and that's for sure. And I, I do enjoy that. I do enjoy teaching. And this is something that I, I pray that you'll can. Let me say this. this is, these studies are not, ex, um, they're not conclusive, right? They're not like, okay, that's all you need to know about the deity of Christ. That's it. Thank you for coming. They're not in any way conclusive, what they are supposed to be is a catalyst for additional study so that you continue to study and show yourself approved uh, unto God. So let me encourage you um, to, to do that. If you want additional resources, I'd be happy to provide those for you in any form. Um, there's lots of different ways to sort of digest media about the deity of Christ or books or podcasts or articles. Uh, let me encourage you to continue to study it out and, um, and uh, grow in the grace and the grace of God. Because we are, what are we? We are students of the word. And so as developing disciples, we are constantly developing until Jesus comes. 
And so this is, this is what we do. And I pray that these will be a help to you. And I pray that you'll be able to understand more who Jesus is. Very excited for our next study. So next week, prayer night. And, uh, and then after that, take a break. And then we'll jump into um, our studies, a uh, study on mental health. I'm excited about that. Uh, we've got some folks from the congregation here that are experts in that, uh, that are going to help be a part of that uh, seminar, uh, that those studies, and um, and then um, I'll be bringing some things from the Word. I'm also reading some additional resources right now that are helping me because I I want to be a student as well of this and try to be a, a, a faithful pastor to help those that are uh, afflicted and hurting or going through something or don't understand because. Um, we have to walk them through. The key in that, just so you understand, it's the same thing, that this study on mental health is not in any way conclusive. Okay, do these things and you're good. It is very much a catalyst approach to let's begin that conversation and let's continue it on. Um, and it's been, it's been really eye-opening already in what I've studied in some of these things. So. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, living. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, that's the goal. The goal is for you to understand the Bible, for you to have a hunger and thirst for the word of God. That's the, uh, that's the idea, that you have an appetite for the word and that you would understand that the Bible is not conclusive in everything. It doesn't tell us what kind of chairs to buy. It doesn't tell us, you know, what car to drive, but it is exhaustive in that it has principles that connect to every area of life that we can go to as a guide to direct us. So this is what we're doing in five weeks from now. God, what does your word say about mental health? God, what does your word say about your word? Which is the next one. God, what does your word say about and let it guide us and direct us? So with that, let me pray. Thank you for being here and uh, we'll be dismissed. Lord, you are good. You are sovereign. You are the object of our worship. Lord, we ascribe the greatest respect and the greatest awe and worth to you. As Isaiah said, Lord, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and your glory filled the temple. Lord, you are majestic and even in your beauty and in your splendor and your majesty, Lord, you humbled yourself to come down to us, to live among us, to uh, be bruised for us, to be rejected by us, to uh, be tortured because of us, and yet you still love us. And Lord, we are so just absolutely in awe and thankful of your goodness. Father, I pray that your deity would be something that we grow in so that we live out our lives differently because we truly believe that Jesus is God, that he is the only way, he is the only savior, he is the only, you are the only one that's worthy of worship. And Father, may that be reflective in our lives as developing disciples of Jesus Christ, we pray. We love you, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a great night, Lord willing, we'll see you, see you Sunday. It's all right there. Yep.